Hello everyone, and welcome to the remastered 10th episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring John Kramer from the Saw franchise. There have been two new entries in this franchise since I released the original video three years ago, and I believe that means it's the perfect time for a remaster. Now my original goal with these remasters was to not only cover new information about these characters, but improve the quality of the original video I released. With that being said, going forward, there's doubtlessly going to be new entries in many of the franchises that feature characters I've already covered, so I wanted to let you all know that in the future, if a video has already been remastered, I won't be doing the entire thing over again when a new entry in a series comes out, as the main point of the remasters is that improvement in quality, and I shouldn't need to do that again. So instead, I plan to make small update videos to certain characters when applicable. With that out of the way, in this video we're going to be delving into the complex lore surrounding John Kramer, a man whose grief and disillusionment with the chaotic nature of the universe, as well as human arrogance and hubris, has led him to becoming this twisted game warden of grotesque proportions. Now these films have been criticized as being nothing more than torture porn, and it's easy to see why, but that's not all they are, and the story and character of John Kramer is complex, intricate, and fascinating. Yes, his methods are incredibly revolting, but it's his philosophy and the reasons behind his actions that elevate these films past something more than just an outlet for gore. In the previous video, I made the claim that John is more of a villain for villains than anything, and while that may be true for some of his players, as many of you pointed out, this isn't exactly the case, and in this video, we'll be weaving in and out of John's ideology and actions so we can more accurately discern where exactly he falls on the scale of morality this time around. Now without further ado, let the games begin. We don't know anything about John's childhood, but we're given ample information about who the adult John Kramer was prior to taking on the Jigsaw persona. John was a master civil engineer and architect, a man who had received recognition from the highest echelons of his professional world and became wealthy and successful as a result. Years prior to the events of the first film, John would meet Jill Tuck, a medical health professional who he fell in love with and married. While there are many aspects of one person that can attract them to another, there's something that John and Jill shared in common that doubtlessly brought them closer together, a shared desire to help people. With the help of John's friend Art Blank, he began a foundation known as the Urban Renewal Group, a real estate company that focused on developing vacant and rundown properties, as well as housing for the needy, with the motto, Four Walls Build a Home. Not long after, John helped his wife open the Homeward Bound Clinic, a recovery clinic for drug addicts, which John gave the motto, Cherish Your Life, a phrase that John would later factor into much of his work as Jigsaw. With the Urban Renewal Group and the Homeward Bound Clinic in hand, John and Jill were poised to provide their community with much needed aid beyond what many humanitarians could hope to accomplish, and the future for the Kramers looked ever brighter once they learned that Jill became pregnant during the Year of the Pig, as John had planned. Ecstatic at the prospect of having his child born during the lucky year of the pig, John chose to name his son after the first building he designed, the Gideon Meatpacking Plant. With the beginnings of a family on the way, everything in John's life seemed to have been going better than he could have ever imagined, and during this time period, he was perhaps the happiest he had ever been, which we see in a home video Jill is watching in the sixth film. However, this happy existence wasn't fated to last, as one night when Jill was locking up at the clinic, a particularly volatile patient by the name of Cecil Adams chose to rob the clinic, and in the process, he caused Jill to suffer trauma to her stomach, which then caused her to miscarry Gideon, and it would be this event that would change not just John's life, but the lives of perhaps hundreds hundreds of people. After losing his child, John became severely depressed to the point that he was lashing out at the people closest to him, like his friend Art Blank, who had helped him start the Urban Renewal Group, and he even went so far as to assault his once beloved wife, an event that ensured his wife essentially became a stranger to him, as he fell deeper and deeper into the bottomless pit that is despair. Not even a reminder from Art of the many less fortunate souls awaiting John's help could tear this once altruistic man from his despondency, and at this point, it seemed that John was lost. To make matters worse, not long after his his son's demise, John was diagnosed with terminal colon cancer and a frontal lobe tumor. Though John was unaware of it at the time, in the film Jigsaw, it's revealed that John's treatment could have been much more successful had it not been for a mix-up of his x-rays by Dr. Logan Nelson, which resulted in his cancer being untreatable by the time it was actually caught by Dr. Lawrence Gordon. And because of this advanced diagnosis, as well as his age, he was denied coverage by the head of his insurance company, William Easton, and following his own virtual death sentence, his sorrow became too much for him to bear, and John chose to end his life by driving his car over the edge of a cliff. However, John survived, and after pulling rebar through his innards, much to his surprise, he found that he was actually grateful to be alive, the intense and brutal pain he just experienced, galvanizing his soul and renewing his will to live. 
While the loss of Gideon was the catalyst for John's eventual suicide attempt, it would be his survival of this attempt that would truly begin his transformation into the dreaded Jigsaw. When John realized the enormity of the emotions he felt after his survival, he was granted a moment of sinister clarity, that being the realization that it was not the charity one bestows upon others that pushes them towards a fulfilling and valued life, but the threat of death and bodily harm, and the will to overcome that threat, an extreme that spurs the despondent to make something of their lives, to find value in that which they forsook, in the face of ultimate doom. An extension of this line of thinking forms a core part of John's philosophy, which are the notions that nothing is permanent, that anything can happen to anyone no matter how virtuous or insidious a person might be, and that everybody, no matter their crimes, deserves a chance to turn their lives around. When John is conducting the test of Cecil Adams, he offers him the following musing, good doesn't lead to good, nor bad to bad. People steal, don't get caught, and live the good life. Others lie, cheat, and get elected. Some people stop to help a stranded motorist and get taken out by a speeding semi. There's no accounting for it. How you play the cards you're dealt, that's all that matters. What this bit of dialogue imparts upon us is one, how John, a man who gave so much back to the world around him, yet has been made to suffer a series of deeply traumatizing tragedies, has come to terms with the unfortunate reality of his situation, that bad things happen to good people, and vice versa, and crying why me, in the face of the chaotic nature of the universe, does a person no good. And the second thing we learn here is that John believes that no person, no matter how horrid, negligent, or complacent they are, is capable of redeeming themselves by confronting and conquering conquering death, and in the process, finding within themselves the will to live, as they desperately scramble to preserve their life at any cost, which then results in a subsequent drive to make something more of their wretched existence, all of which is born out of a gruesome amount of adversity. Now when watching the barbarity of his games unfold, it's easy to assume that John is quite ecstatic about ripping people to shreds. But when he's recruiting Mark Hoffman to his cause following the completion of his lone wolf game that assured the death of his sister's killer, Seth Baxter, John remarks that killing is distasteful to him. And when you really take a look at the story of John Kramer, his aversion to death couldn't be more evident. John's entire reason for being was to improve the lives of others, to uplift those who were downtrodden and forgotten by the world around them. And that didn't really change once he became Jigsaw. He has always abhorred wasted lives, and he sought to fix them to the best of his abilities. And as Jigsaw, he desires to do the same, only now his methods for doing so have been corrupted into a shadowy version of what his charitable endeavors once were. In the same vein, John has always deplored killing, and once his son was denied life by Cecil Adams, his aversion to all forms of murder became even more pronounced. With that in mind, John doesn't actually want anyone to die when they're playing one of his games. Quite the opposite, actually. The whole point of these games is for the people playing them to turn their lives around by seeing the error of their ways and realizing that their lives are worth living, which requires them to be alive. If John wanted to murder all these people, he could have very easily done so without putting them through all this hardship. Though these tests are traumatizing, and sometimes physically harmful to the players of his games, it's these traumatizing experiences that are meant to push them towards living their lives in meaningful ways, and no game created by John has ever been used to assure the death of any participant. Life is central to John's MO, and if every single person had managed to survive his games, that would have fulfilled him far more than their failures to do so ever could have. Just how central the will to live is to John's overall philosophy, and his decision to create his myriad games, is further expanded upon when we learn of John's interaction with the head of the umbrella insurance company William Easton, at an event his company sponsored for the Homeward Bound Clinic. While discussing William's formula that he's developed to decide who to grant coverage to, John finds the fact that William decides who lives and who dies, while ignoring the the human will to live, disturbing, a component of the human psyche that John believes is more important in deciding whether or not any given person will overcome the obstacles that are presented to them. There is something that William and John have in common though, and that's the fact that they both have methods for choosing the people that they're going to help. The people who John forces to play his games are all quote unquote guilty of three things. Either they waste their lives via self-destructive behavior, they harm people with criminal activities or other shady endeavors, or they're generally negligent or abhorrent people who treat the people around them terribly or who handle the lives of others without any regard for their well-being due to their callousness and selfishness. John claims to choose who these mildly to completely terrible people are without emotion factoring into his decisions, which is true for some of his victims, but as we'll cover later on, 
run, that isn't exactly the case for every single one of his players. But for now, it's important to note that no one plays any of John's games without having deserved it in some way, and there is never a time where John finds people to entrap in a random manner. Now aside from the direct tenets of his philosophy, there are a few things that also seem to influence John's actions. As we learned earlier, John desired for his son to be born in the year of the pig for good luck, a sign that he's a superstitious man to a certain degree. And while superstition doesn't really play into his jigsaw persona, the memory of his son certainly does. We see several times throughout the series that John's preferred disguise for himself and his apprentices is that of dark clothing combined with a pig mask. And perhaps the reason he and his apprentices utilize these pig masks is for luck. But it's more likely that this choice is simply an homage to the child he's lost, as when you consider that John's use of his signature jigsaw doll Billy, a doll that was inspired by the one he originally created for his son, is another homage to Gideon, it would make sense that the masks serve the same purpose. If it wasn't obvious enough already by just how broken John was over the death of his son, this reinforces the idea that John is an immensely sentimental man, and I imagine that the past is something that he isn't fully capable of letting go of. The haunting memories of his shattered family stabbing him day by day, like so many shards of broken glass. Though we also have to consider that these nods to Gideon could also mean that John sees his work as a replacement for his child, a tribute to the life that was lost forever, living on in some way, just as John strives to. What reinforces this idea is the fact that John has shown his appreciation for feats of skill that have withstood the test of time, which we learn in a scene where John shows Jill his new workshop in a flashback and points out the 300-year-old clock in his possession that still works despite how much time has passed. And whereas before John was attempting to make his legacy into that of a philanthropist through his foundation and Jill's clinic, now he seeks to leave a similar yet altogether different legacy by acting as a savior of lost souls, the blood-soaked angel guiding his wayward flock towards their salvation, whose impact is measured in the hideous lives that he's made beautiful through his work. And because he's partially made his work a tribute to his son, it's not just John's legacy that he's fighting for here, but Gideon's as well. However, it's not just his success stories that color John's legacy. His failures have quite the impact on how the world views John Kramer and his life's work. When any of John's players fail to overcome the challenges they're presented with, they leave a far more impactful impression on the people who are forced to see the gory details of those failures. John's far-reaching plans and the gruesome nature of his work ensures that he will without a doubt be remembered after he is gone. Now these are the circumstances that led to John developing his dread philosophy, as well as the central components of it. But the intricacies of the games he creates requires not only a warped worldview, but the skills and traits to make these dark designs a reality, which John has in abundance. Let's start with his intellect, which is central to every component of his character. John is incredibly smart, which is evident in his status as a successful and inventive engineer and architect, a man who's even been recognized in the press for his proficiency in the field. And his skill in this regard is is only further compounded by the intricate contraptions that he constructs for his victims. With so many moving parts and mechanisms, it takes an expert craftsman and careful planner to make these inventions work in the real world, showing a level of skill that few possess, which indicates that he could have been a prodigy when he was younger. Now his proficiency in engineering and invention are both great indicators of his intellect. But these are far from being the only things that John is proficient in. He's a master at manipulation, planning, scheming, espionage, and stealth, all of which he employs to great effect in his work. As far as manipulation goes, John's skill in this regard is mostly found in how well he's able to persuade people into not only seeing his point of view, but embracing it. And the number of accomplices he recruits, and how he acquires them, are a testament to this skill. In total, he manages to accrue five accomplices throughout the films that more or less stay true to his line of thinking to the very end, which speaks both to the power of his message as well as the magnanimous nature of his overall character. Logan Nelson is the one outlier out of all of his apprentices, as Logan gravitated to John and his cause through admiration alone, but the others took a bit more convincing. Amanda Young chooses to ally herself with John because he saved her from a life of addiction and poverty that was slowly but surely leading her towards her own demise. Through Amanda's rehabilitation, John also manages to convince his ex-wife Jill that his methods are actually sound, showing her that a woman she once thought of as a lost cause has become a new woman, one who's been cured of her former maladies through his work. While both of these conversions might not seem like manipulation on the surface, you have to remember that John is a highly organized, plan-centric individual, and his ability to anticipate the next moves the human brain will make assures that anything related to his machinations is bound to have been a part of his plan, and that's definitely the case with the conversions of Amanda and Jill. Mark Hoffman was brought over to John's side through a combination of blackmail and coercion. 
as John effectively played to Mark's disillusionment with the justice system, while also assuring him that should he choose to go against John, that his life would essentially be over, as John had systems in place to ensure that Mark's murder of Seth Baxter would be brought into the public spotlight should he be arrested or killed. Lawrence Gordon is converted to the cause after John treats his wounds following the successful completion of his test, and because he brings a crucial medical component into John's games, he undoubtedly planned to convert him from the get-go, as Gordon is shown helping John with all the procedures on the victims that require a surgeon's hand. However, his skills and manipulation do not lie solely within his ability to convince people of the righteousness of his cause, but also in his ability to anticipate people's actions in his tests, as we see that he's adept at crafting these games in such a way that the people involved in them them, are guided towards taking the option that ultimately satisfies his goals as his victims endure their test. As far as scheming and planning goes, John's plans are far-reaching and multifaceted, involving the accurate prediction of events and the actions people will take, so that his plans will always come to fruition, no matter the choices he gives people. His ability to accurately read the minds and hearts of his accomplices and victims is central to this, giving him the foresight to account for every possible scenario that might occur throughout one of his plans. Lastly, his skills in espionage and stealth can be grouped together as one component. John is highly informed on all aspects of his victims' lives, and in order to be so informed, he stalks his victims himself, or with the help of his accomplices, gathering photos, habits, and routines to kidnap his victims without fail. And he's even able to evade police capture until he desires to be caught to further his own plans. Not once does one of his victims even realize they're being followed until it's too late. All of these things combined together makes John worthy of a moniker that few villains can claim, that of a mastermind. Due to his varied skill set, his plans are so utterly foolproof and without fail that not a single one of his endeavors ever ends in failure, even after his death. Either you win his game, or you lose. There are no malfunctions, no moments where you can use these contraptions to your advantage. There are only two choices, live or die. After he has acquired all of his accomplices, John begins planning for how his apprentices will carry out his will, and the extent of these plans is impressive and staggering. This shows that he's a master of strategy on a level that even people who study the subject for years rarely achieve. So now that we have a firm grasp on all the important aspects of John, we now need to answer one very important question. Is there any moral justification for what John Kramer puts people through in his games? On some level, sure, but overall, not really. What John is essentially doing with these games is providing people with a twisted form of therapy by putting them through harrowing experiences that are designed to ignite gratitude and the will to live within them. Now negative experiences are a fine enough deterrent for harmful or criminal activities. After all, that's the entire idea behind a prison system, or any other punishment for that matter. They're things that make you think, wow, this is horrible, I never want to go through this again, I'm going to turn my life around and make something more of myself, so I won't ever have to feel the way I feel now again. This concept as a whole is fine as well, as when someone does something that harms themselves or others, they shouldn't be rewarded for that behavior. But as we're all well aware, even legal institutions are incredibly flawed, and turning to extra-legal forms of justice are bound to be just as flawed, especially when you choose to take the negative experiences you put people through in the name of justice to the extreme. Aside from the obvious barbarity of John's games, what really ruins John's work is the severe cost of failing one of his games, as there are few people playing these games who actually deserve to suffer the fate that losing a game presents them. There are some who might deserve the worst, but does a drug addict deserve to have her head crushed because she's wasting her life? No. Does a doctor deserve to have his family threatened and his life endangered because of his negligence? No. There are ways to assist in bringing people to justice who need to be brought to justice without subjecting them to vast amounts of cruelty, and there are ways to hold people accountable for their negligence and malpractice without threatening them with a gruesome death or bodily disfigurement. And as John is well aware, you don't need to wire someone's body to a murder machine to help them kick their drug habit. What John is doing is extreme and unnecessary, and his methods only make sense to him and his acolytes because of how warped their worldviews have become due to the negative experiences they've had to endure. The drastic ultimatum that failure of a game presents to the player is just wrong, not to mention the disfigurement that they usually suffer, even if they win. Milder forms of punishment are more acceptable because they aren't built around ultimatums. For example, unless you're sentenced to life in prison, or you die before you've reached the end of your sentence, imprisonment isn't specifically designed to kill you. But even when it is, you aren't being presented with immense danger to your person on a day-to-day -day basis. You're just being denied portions of your life 
for however long you're incarcerated, making it a much more mild punishment in comparison to the ones that John puts people through. The other thing to consider here is that a lot of the people who play John's games, like many people who are punished legally, need help. Help that his foundation and his wife's clinic were trying to provide. The tragic thing about John's philosophy of pushing people towards helping themselves is that it's actually a core principle of many humanitarian efforts. You can provide someone with robust housing, stable employment, and the tools they need to shed their negative habits, but in the end, it's up to the individual to make something of their lives, to be better today than they were yesterday. You can point a person in the right direction, but you can't force them to be the person you want them to be, or even who they want to be. They have to make that choice for themselves. John's methods are designed to embody this idea, but are the potential deaths of people who don't deserve to die something that we should accept as an alternative form of therapy or assistance? No, it's not. And as much as John's success stories can be lauded for how they've managed to turn the lives of people involved around, his failures are more than enough to cancel out all of them. As far as John's supposed emotional distance from his victims is concerned, that claim can be only partially validated. There are several people who play John's games that affected John personally, and while John claims to choose his victims without emotion, and also claims to detest vengeance, there's no way that John isn't satisfied in some way when people like Cecil Adams, Art Blank, or William Easton are forced to suffer because of his games. So as much as he'd like to tout himself as an arbitrary game warden here, there's no way that's truly the case, and whatever virtue the moniker of impartial judge might have brought to his character is ruined by this notion. So with everything we've discussed in mind, what is there to say about John Kramer? He was a kind and compassionate man who had dedicated his life to helping humanity and finding the good in people, wishing only to provide a better life for those who could not do so for themselves. By experiencing several unfortunate events in quick succession, his compassion became nearly non-existent as he wallowed in the all-consuming dread of his situation, becoming more and more disillusioned with the hopelessness of the human condition until he chose to take his life. After his survival, this once virtuous and noble man was impelled to bring the clarity he had been given through his brush with death to others, preserving any small vestige of the life he's lost and the work that he's dedicated his now short life to. While John's choice upon his survival to become the dreaded Jigsaw was his own, we cannot discount the circumstances that led him to this point. In recent videos, it's been pertinent for me to discuss the extensive ramifications of one's evil deeds, how one act of malice can cause a domino effect of darkness to occur that impacts countless lives, no matter how big or small that action is. This is the case with Cecil and the choice he made to rob the clinic that night. As though Cecil was unaware that he'd be causing a woman to miscarry, and that that miscarriage would lead to a man dedicating his life to torturing people for the sake of an ersatz philosophy, the fact remains that had he not chose to rob the clinic that night, none of the events of this series would have ever occurred, including the advent of the copycat killers that resulted from John's own actions. Regardless, John must be held accountable for the crimes he's committed, and while he isn't the villain for villains that I once claimed he was, he truly is a villain, a man who might not believe he is a murderer by his own logic, but who definitely is one, a villain for those in his life that have been villains to him, or who he has observed following a path of negligence, criminal personality apathy, or complacency, wishing to offer them a simple choice, live or die, a choice that he believes absolves him from the sin of murder. It surely doesn't though, as none of these people would have died if they weren't put into one of John's games. And though John's methods are sickening, his mastermind level planning and unique worldview prove that he's more than a callous butcher. But butcher or not, the story of John Kramer is a sinister example of what immense amount of evil can manifest from the evil actions of others. Evil so great that it could transform a man's dedication to the human condition into a dark version of the nobility he once held. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on John? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, to my patrons, and to anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and subreddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.